We started uh, last week a new series, and we will continue on with this week. and And uh, it's over. It's over the idea of hell. And so somebody this morning, we were walking into the fellowship hall, and somebody goes, "Hey, if we're talking about hell, why don't we take some of the props that we used down in Judgment House?" And bring them up and we'll decorate the stage. And I thought that was a great idea. So we're going to have some flames on stage this morning just to, uh, just to give us a good visual of what it is we're talking about. There we go. All right. They're kind of mesmerizing, aren't they? Concern. How many of you have or have had overprotective parents? Okay. How many of you are not raising your hand right now because you put your hand down, (laughs) Jalen. How many of you are not putting your hand up right now because your parent is in the room? (laughs) You just gave yourself away by putting your hand back up. That's right. I uh, I grew up with overprotective parents. Uh, we'll be honest, my mom, dad was was pretty laid back. Mom was was pretty overprotective. I was constantly made to check in hourly whenever I'd go to a friend's house. Just just check in with mom and dad. And if I was out riding my bike, I would have to make sure I came by and just checked in. If I went to a friend's house, I had to call. Once I started driving. There was a whole list of rules that I had to follow, and one of them was whenever I get to where I'm going, I call, which was pretty difficult because cell phones weren't a thing yet. So I'd have to either get somebody that, that had a phone or, or, or use a pay phone. Do they even have those anymore? It's tough to find one. Why were my parents so overprotective? Because they loved me. They wanted to make sure I was safe. They were concerned for my well-being. At times, albeit a little too concerned, case in point, I can remember playing basketball as a middle schooler. There's a picture up here, I think. Yes? (laughs) Yes, that was going into my seventh grade year. Notice how big and tall and strong I am. It's... I was about Jalen's height. I was short. I can remember playing basketball, and uh, this, this is at the school. This is front of the, the front of the school, the fans and everything. And I remember I was in the middle of a jump ball. You guys know what a jump ball is? Not, not the tip-off, but a jump ball. Ball was, was kind of rolling on the floor. I grab it, the other team grabs it, and we're wrestling over it, right? Problem was I, I somehow managed to find the tallest, biggest, strongest guy on the other team to fight over the jump ball with. Halfway through fighting over the jump ball, my feet left the ground, and I felt myself being flung around like a rag doll. (laughs) At which point, my mother comes running onto the court screaming, Stop! (laughs) Mom, if you're watching, I remember very clearly. (laughs) At which point, the ref blew the whistle, and there was this really awkward silence. Everybody just kind of looked around, and, and I remember... I remember two things. I remember being furious that that had happened. And I remember hearing later my dad look at my mom and say, don't ever do that again. (laughs) The older I've got, however, the more kids I've had, I realize now where she was coming from. And I see my own kids in, in, in situations. And that overprotective concern comes out. Why did my mom rush the court? She was concerned for my well-being and her actions showed it. I want you to hang on to that thought because that's what we're going to be talking about this morning as we continue in our series called Reflections of Fire. And if you guys were here last week, you remember that we talked about this concept of going all the way back to the beginning and making it so very clear that everybody understands that hell is a real place. Lost souls who do not have a relationship with Jesus Christ will spend an eternity 
in hell. It seemed like the best place to start when, when, when we're talking about the seriousness of what hell is. And if you guys remember, the very last thing that I left us with at the end of the message last week was hell is real and the church should act like it, literally. The idea being that there are some attributes that we see play out in hell that should be in every single church in the world. Yes, I said that right. Our church should reflect some of the attributes of what makes hell, hell. Turn with me this morning, if you would, to Luke chapter 16. And we find ourselves this morning, Jesus is, is, is teaching and preaching to, to the crowds again. And, and in this particular crowd, he has some, some fair, bless you. Wow. We have some Pharisees in the crowd, the, 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 the know-it-alls, right? And they're asking Jesus some pretty deep theological questions. They're trying to, trying to get him to slip up. They're trying to get him to say something that he shouldn't say. They're trying to find some way to bring accusation against him. So far, Jesus has told a few parables. He's told the parable of the wedding feast, the parable of the great banquet, the parable of the lost sheep the parable of the lost coin, the prodigal son, the dishonest manager. And then Jesus transitions to this odd story. It doesn't, it doesn't really flow at, at first when you're looking at it with the rest of them, but as you kind of get into it, you understand, I see, I see where Jesus was going with this, but he starts to talk about this rich man and a poor man. He tells of how they both endured the same fate, they both died. However, upon death, one went up and one went down. Stand with me if you would this morning as we read Luke chapter 16, verses 19 and following. Jesus said, there was a rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and who feasted sumptuously every day. At his gate was laid a poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores, who desired to be fed with what fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, even the dogs came and licked his sores. The poor man died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was bur buried. And in Hades, being in torment, he lifted up his eyes and he saw Abraham far off, and Lazarus at his side, and he called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus to dip the end of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am in anguish in this flame. But Abraham said, Child, remember that you in your lifetime received your good things, and Lazarus received in like manner bad things, but now he is comforted here. You are, and you are in anguish. And besides all this between us and you, a great chasm has been fixed in order that those who would pass from here to you may not be able, and none may cross from there to us. And he said, the rich man, then I beg you, Father, to send to my father's house, for I have five brothers, so that he may warn them, lest they also come into this place of torment. But Abraham said, they have Moses. And the prophets, let them hear them. And he said, no, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. And he said to him, if they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced if someone should rise from the dead. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this morning. Lord, I thank you for the power of your word, God, for the clarity and for the truth that it presents. Lord, I pray this morning as we take a close look at hell, Lord, as we take a close look at the church, God, that you would give us discernment and wisdom as we study the scriptures. God, I pray that you will receive glory this morning in all that we do. We ask these things in Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated. You know... 
we talked last week that most people who come to church, even people who don't come to church, most all of them believe that there is a heaven of sorts. Some sort of heaven exists. But hell, on the other hand, that's, that's a different story. You know, especially out on the streets, you'll see people, well, I don't, I don't necessarily believe in hell. Sometimes you come into a church and you'll hear, I don't believe that, that hell is real. I don't believe that God really sends people to hell. Some people think that hell is this cruel, unkind, and unfair place. The reality is, and we talked last week, that hell was created for Satan and his angels. And the reality is, it, it, it is all of those things. But it's like that because it's void of God's presence. The tragic truth is that most people who end up in hell will be shocked that they find themselves there. Matthew 7, 22 to 23 says this, On that day many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. So many people on the day of judgment are going to hear those words. A recent poll uh, was, was done a few years back, and, and, and virtually everybody who they polled said that they believe in some sort of heaven. They also followed up with immediately, well, I'm going there. Even though they may not have known Jesus, maybe they may not have even been to a church, they believe that they're going to go to some happy place when they die. They were very much like the rich man in our story this morning. You ever wonder why Jesus told this story the way that he told this story? He didn't just take a a common person. He didn't take the median. He took the two extremes, right? He took the rich man and the poor man. There was a reason for that. There was a reason why he chose those two figures to tell this this, this story. And and it's because the idea is, in the Jewish culture of Jesus' day, if you were rich, that means you were blessed by God. There was something very holy, very special about you. God loved you because you were given all of these great riches. And so in that context, when Jesus starts out this story, what does everybody think immediately? Oh, well, the rich man, when he dies, he's going to go to heaven. Because that's what they believe. Likewise, the poor man, everybody was thinking, oh, well, he's a poor man. Obviously, he's not blessed by God. Obviously, he's not loved by God the way that he should be. Obviously, he's done some things that has created this chasm between him and God, and he'll never, he'll never make it to heaven. Matthew 19, 24 says this, again, I tell you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. How true is that? I know every single one of us in here has, 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 has said or thought at least at some point in our life, if I just had a little more money, things would be better. If I just had a little bit more, if I was rich, things would be great. Have you looked at some of the rich and famous and the lives that they live? They've tried to fill that void with money, and it, and it just it doesn't fit. I think oftentimes you see people struggle even more when they have great, great, amount, great amounts of money. Nonetheless, the rich man, he finds himself in Hades or, or, or hell. And then we're given this, this account, so to speak, this, this conversation that takes place between him and Father Abraham. And so on, on a quick side note, I'll tell you that, that we're going to jump around a little bit in this conversation. We're not going to take it from the top and go to the bottom. We're, we're going to work around a little bit as, as, as we go through this passage. Um, so the first thing that we discussed may not actually be the first attribute that we see talked about, but, but we will eventually cover all of those as as we look through but but as we look at the rich man as we look at the poor man this morning both of them have died they have both landed in their final destinations judgment has been cast their choices were made the poor man is in heaven the rich man in hell and the rich man it says looks up 
And he sees Father Abraham and Lazarus standing in heaven. Don't get hung up on the theological correctness of, of what we're doing here. Jesus is telling a parable. He's, he's, he's proving a point, so don't get hung up on that part. The rich man looks at Abraham. They have this short conversation. And at the end of this conversation, or halfway through rather, Abraham tells the rich man, you are going to now spend an eternity separated from God. There is no crossing over. There is no you coming up here, Lazarus coming down there. It doesn't work that way, right? It is what it is. The choice has been made. It was the wrong choice, obviously, for the rich man. And it's at this point in our story that we see our first attribute of hell. Hell is a place of memory. Hell is a place of memory. Why do we say that? Because the next words that come out of the rich man's mouth are this, verse 27, and he said, Then I beg you, Father, to send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, so that they may warn them, so that he may warn them, lest they also come into this place of torment. What do we see here? Well, clearly, clearly, the rich man has died. He's in judgment. He's in hell, an eternity away from God, yet he still remembers his family. Five brothers, to be exact. More important than that, probably the most heartbreaking part of this entire story is that he remembers they're up there, they still have a chance to make a decision, and he can't do anything about it. You want to pour salt in the wound? He realizes the example that he set for his five brothers. He can't change that. Church, when was the last time, when was the last time that, that you stopped, and you remember we talked last week, we talked last week about remembering where we came from, right? We talked about we were all sinners, we were all dead in our sin, we were all just like the rich men, we were all just like the five brothers. For those of us that, that asked forgiveness, for those of us that came into the family of Christ, We've moved on from that life, and, and, and hopefully we've walked away from that life of sin. But sometimes we have to stop and remember and think back of who we were to remind us of how dead we were in our sin. We made a choice. We were forgiven. We were cleansed. We moved on. How many of us still have friends and family that have not made that decision? My fear is that too many in the church today, that we have forgotten how ugly, addicting, controlling, and destroying sin can be in our lives. We've fallen in this bubble of, of church life. That's a dangerous place to be. Because we seem to forget and we seem to lose sight of where we came from and where others are going, we lose that eagerness that we're supposed to have to be reaching those who are lost. Just as in hell, just as we see play out in this story, the church, we have to remember, probably the most important thing, we have to be passionate about reaching the lost. We have to be. The second thing that we see play out in, in, in this story is that hell is a place of conscience. Hell is a place of conscience. The rich man, he may never have heard the gospel. He may never have, 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 have been given the, 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 the info on what it is to be saved, and, and, and he may not have even have tried to do any of the stuff that he was supposed to do, but the reality of it is he still has the same conscience that every man on this planet has. When we read in Romans 3.19, and following, it says this, Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be stopped, and the whole world may be held accountable to God. For by works of the law, no human being 
will be justified in his sight since through the law comes the knowledge of sin. What does that mean? It means that you have a calling. It means that God is calling to you. It means that you are without excuse. The rich man remembered his family. He loved his family. He remembers the example that he set for his family. The rich man in hell, he now knows the key to salvation comes through repentance of sins. Did you catch that in his conversation with Abraham? Go, let Lazarus tell my brothers that they may repent and not come to this place. He gets it now. He understands. He realizes how things were supposed to play out on earth. He, he understands what it was that he was supposed to do. But it's too late. He failed. Church, just as in hell, we are to be conscientious of what we do. I'm not making excuses for, for the rich man, um, but in our story, he was lost, right? And, and, and we say, how do we, how do we expect the lost to know they're lost lest we share with them that they're lost? God cries out to every man. The rich man should have been seeking the Lord's heart. The rich man should have been doing what was right in the eyes of the Lord. He had the instruction, so he is without excuse. But for him, it's too late now. We as the church, we are without excuse as well. Why? Well, because we know better, right? We know better right now, right? While we're all still sitting here living and breathing, we all have this conscious understanding of what happens to people if they don't have a relationship with Christ and they pass away, they go to hell. If that doesn't make us uncomfortable, I may ask you to, to talk to God about your own salvation, because that should make you a little uncomfortable. We know the consequences of not asking forgiveness of sins. And while we sit here this morning, while we sit here every Sunday and we come on Wednesdays and we do all the things that the church does, there are millions of people outside the doors. They don't understand. They don't have the same knowledge that you have. You've been given that knowledge, that relationship for a reason, for a purpose, and that is to share with them the consequences of not making the right choice. I want you to understand it and hear me very clearly when I say this. It was too late for the rich man. It's not too late for us. And because it's not too late for us, it's not too late for all the other rich men out in the world who don't have that knowledge or that relationship with Jesus Christ. Finally, this morning, Hell is a place of concern. It's a place of concern. Concern for what? Concern for the lost. Did you catch that in the story? Again, 27, and he said, Then I beg you, Father, to send into my father's house, for I have five brothers, so that he may warn them, lest they also come into this place of torment. The story goes on, the conversation continues. What's the rich man doing? He's crying out to Abraham saying, please, please let my brothers know the truth. He didn't want to see his family end up in the same position that he was in. He begged, he begged Abraham to do something, do anything, whatever it takes. Raise a man from the dead. And Abraham says it, it won't matter. It won't matter. Church? When was the last time that you showed the same amount of concern for a lost person as the rich man did for his family? I don't want you to miss the emotion 
in the dialogue a, 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 as we read through that. The, the, the rich man is not saying, hey, yo, Abraham, yeah, if you get time, can you maybe send Lazarus? Tell my friends and family that, you know, this place is real and, and heaven and hell and life and death, eternity, stuff like that. Can you, can, you, can you do that for me? That's not what we see play out. He is crying out to Abraham, please, Father Abraham, please do something and send somebody to tell my family. Please. It's a cry from the heart. It's a concern for the lost. So I ask you again, when was the last time that you showed this same amount of concern for the lost that we see the rich man showing for his family? Here's the reality. We as the church should have more concern for the lost going to hell than anything else that we do on this planet. That should be priority number one. You know, even though we're only in week two of our series, this may, this may possibly be the most important attribute of hell there is. You show me a Christian that has a genuine, heartfelt, passionate, God-driven concern for the lost, and I will show you a Christian who has everything going the right direction. I will show you a Christian who knows what their calling is. I admit, as a pastor, we, we throw out these words sometimes, and, 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 and we try to categorize things and people and places and, and, and it can get confusing, it can get ambiguous. So I'm going to change one of my words. When we use the word church, it, it, it can sometimes not narrow down quite enough the way that it needs to. So I'm going to say it like this. Are you concerned with the condition of the lost? I hope the answer is yes. Because if it's not, my follow-up question would be, then why are you here? Maybe a little more invasive than that. Are you concerned with the condition of the lost and do your actions show it? You can be concerned all day. But if you don't do anything about it, were you really as concerned as you thought? Are you willing to run out on the basketball court and scream stop in the middle of a game because you're that concerned? Are you willing to step in the path of a lost person and say, stop. Let me share some stuff with you. My prayer this morning, my prayer this morning is that we would all come to that place or we would all get to the point where, where, where we realize that we have a calling, that, that, that we have a, 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 a God-driven calling to share our testimony, to share the truth of the gospel with those around us. And I, and I know for, for, for many of us, and myself, I feel myself in that category, it sometimes is hard to take, it, to take that first step in a conversation. And you start to say the word God, and it just, it just doesn't come out. Can I encourage you this morning? Be obedient. Step out on faith. When you feel and you sense that God has put somebody in your path that needs to hear the truth, to share the truth. What's the worst that could happen? They laugh at you. They tell you to stop. We still have it pretty easy here in the U.S. Probably won't always be that way. The day will come when sharing your faith could mean the difference between life and death. And here's the deal. If you're not willing to share your faith because somebody may laugh at you, are you going to be willing to share your faith when it means your death? I'm not saying that, I'm not saying that to, to, to scare you or anything. I'm saying that to try to get us to realize what we are all called to do simply share our faith 
to show that we have a concern for the lost. I'm going to ask that you would stand with us this morning as we have our time of invitation. If, if the Holy Spirit has spoken to you, maybe there's somebody that the Holy Spirit has put on your heart that you need to come down and, and, and pray for. I want to encourage you to do that this morning. Maybe God's been working in your life in some other area and you just need to come and, and, and spend some time with Him. I want to encourage you to do that. If you, if you would like to have someone pray with you, I'll be down here. Some of our deacons will come down and they would love to pray with you. Whatever the case may be, please be obedient to what the Holy Spirit's doing in your life. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this morning. Lord, I thank you for the truth of your word. God, I thank you for sending your son to die for me. Lord, there are so many people in this world that need to hear that truth. God, I pray that you would empower those in this, in this building right now. Lord God, that they would be bold in their faith, Lord. God, that they would show concern for the lost, Lord. That they would reach out. God, that you would put people in their path specifically that you have called for them to witness to. God, that when our day of judgment comes, Lord, that you will look at us and say, well done, my good and faithful servant. We ask that you would be with us, Lord, as we have this time of invitation. We ask these things in Jesus' name.